Welcome to Fintech Impact. This podcast is an exploration of the financial technology world, interviewing different fintech entrepreneurs about what they do, their story, and what their impact is on consumers, incumbents, and the industry as a whole. Here's your host, award-winning financial planner, university lecturer, and writer, Jason Pereira. Hello, and welcome to Fintech Impact. Today on the podcast, I have Pauline Shum Nolan, the founder of Wealthscope. Wealthscope is an online tool for assessing portfolios, but not just a simple assessment on performance. It looks across various parameters, including factor-based investing, fees, long-term projections of income, all sorts of factors, and really is targeted at a couple of different markets. They are a freemium model to consumers and really are going to target a big B2B play in terms of targeting advisors and institutions. So with that, here's Pauline. Hello, Pauline. Hello. Nice to have you in. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Thanks. So can you tell me about Wealthscope? What is it that you guys do? Well, we are a web application, mm-hmm. and so available through an online platform. Uh, what we try to do is to open up the black box in retail wealth management. For example, um, a lot of investors are doing it themselves and never really had an objective opinion of how they've been doing. Uh, what kind of risks they are exposed to. And so we sort of get to strive to give them a first opinion of how they're doing. Or if you are an investor who've been working with an advisor and advisors are inevitably trying to sell you products, collect a fee. And what we can do with our platform is to give those investors a second opinion of how their uh, portfolios are really doing and from a very comprehensive perspective. And then we tie the portfolio, the investments uh, into retirement planning. So unlike a lot of online uh, calculators, we uh, can actually use any portfolios that you create on our site and you can plug that in for retirement planning. Okay. There's a lot to pick apart there once we come back to it. But before we start looking at all that, tell me about your background and your personal journey. I started as a professor of finance for the last 25 years. And then I was uh, working with the university pension plan and that was, um, and for the last 14 years. And so, you know, mostly on the institutional side. And I, you know, I was seeing that uh, even on the institutional side, a lot of the software for evaluating portfolios are kind of difficult to understand and are not very intuitive. And also there's certain things that we were not finding answers to. For example, you know, I always say this is the genesis of uh, of Wellscope, was that about three, four years ago when the price of oil started to drop at the pension plan, we asked our very expensive consultant, you know, it's a simple question. What is our, you know, portfolio assets, the funds uh, exposure to oil? And we got an answer along the lines of, well, you know, you've got some equity names or an energy credit side. Yeah, there's some exposure infrastructure. You have a whole fund that is uh, investing in energy. But so no we said, well, the answer is to like 10% drop at oil would have this kind of potential implications on your portfolio. Right. Yeah. Well, what is the bottom line? Right. Because yeah. to the extent that we diversify, we, oh, you know, you hopefully part of it. Yeah. Oil. Lovely. Right. Thank you. Right. <laughs> so, so therefore, you know, a thought came to my mind. I thought, well, this is not rocket science. And in my classes, I teach my students, you know, about factor exposure. Those factors could be investing style or it could be macroeconomics factors. So I thought, oh, you know, I can I can get a student to write some codes and and a little program to look at that. And so sort of one thing led to another and people have been telling me, well, yeah, you're doing it for the fund. What about for, for my portfolio? I'll be interested in, in getting some of those answers as well. And then, you know, I talked to different people, more people, and, and then they sort of told me that, well, perhaps, you know, particularly in the retail market where people can't afford to subscribe to expensive software, could you do something there for retail investors? Okay. So that's mm-hmm. interesting. So that's the genesis of it. Out of so many things, it's built uh, based out of a personal need that you had to meet, right? That makes sense. So mm-hmm. it's interesting that what you've done. So can you tell me about how it is you guys monetize off this? Because I've got a couple of leading questions that come from Right. So you see that Wellscope, uh, we've launched the beta of the B2C version, yeah. uh, which is free. Okay. And then we'll always have this sort of uh, 
I mean, I think is fairly comprehensive, but compared to a B2B product is more stripped down, uh, we'll always uh, have that free version. And as an educator for so many years, I always like to have a free version for my students or for a lot of investors out there that are interested in, you know, like I said, using our software to very quickly get a second opinion on demand or build some ETF portfolio. So that will always be the free version that you can see now that is in beta. What we will have, what we will launch later on is a a premium version. And that would be for investors that are willing to pay for more customized opinion, where they can input any portfolios that they're hoping to build or they already have uh, with different stocks and mutual funds and ETFs. And they can, uh, they don't have to link their accounts to us. They can just enter the composition of their portfolio and have those analyzed. You can build any custom benchmarks. Uh, you can have portfolio optimizer and a lot of those premium, what, what I'll call refer to as premium features that would be through a subscription. And then we're also hoping to be working with brokerages and, and use sort of a larger corporations that have sort of, you know, a, a lot of, an army of advisors and provide either secure access to our API or, you know, some sort of white labeling of any, you know, any analytics that they, they like to um, subscribe to. So that's a B2B plan. To be, and then also, um, is there an enterprise play for, for pensions themselves directly too? Or? Yeah, that we can do some sort of custom consulting there because a lot of pension plans, apart from publicly traded securities, they also have a lot of private pool funds and investments. And we will need to get data from the custodian to uh, in order to be able to analyze their portfolios there. But mostly, I think the focus will be more uh, the retail side and in terms of institutional plans, maybe, you know, the smaller plans that can't afford to subscribe to the expensive products out there at the institutional level, mm-hmm. or, you know, family offices um, as well that we're hoping well, to target. Right, right. So really what you're looking at is a free, is a free, a free product or a freemium model mm-hmm. with a B2B paid model as well mm-hmm. to subsidize that entire free spot. And mm-hmm. when I think you, you know, the one thing I will commend you on that you've done off the bat here is that a classic tactic in marketing between on the consumer side mm-hmm. is to say, hey, let me give you a second opinion and look at your statements, right? Mm-hmm. And inevitably, the advisor always finds something wrong with it, whether it be right or wrong, but there's always something to pick on, right? And that's yeah. just, you know, that's normal. Any, any one portfolio, there's always this one thing that's maybe not working right. Of course, the consumers don't have the education to know whether or not that makes mm-hmm. sense or not. So you're the first true second opinion service I've seen that is completely objective because you are not tied to product in any way. So that in mm-hmm. itself is something that was sorely missing from the marketplace. So thank you. And I will be sure to see how I stack up. <laughs> we'll <go there. laughs> right. So take me through, you mentioned a lot of different features. In mm-hmm. this set. So you talked about uh, factor-based analytics. Mm-hmm. You talked about cu- uh, custom benchmarking. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you mentioned something about tying back into financial plans. Can you tell me mm-hmm. about like mm-hmm. what is in your feature set? Right. So we built the analytics uh, first. That was our proof of concept mm-hmm. that uh, allowed us to uh, raise some pre-seed money to create an IT team to bring development in-house. So we have a lot of analytics. A lot of it is based on what I teach in class, what I see at the institutional level, and also to refocus things a little bit for the investor. For example, a big focus of ours is downside protection. So we also have this, you know, downside protection and performance is not your raw returns, but risk adjusted mm-hmm. and also benchmark. And as you know, during the financial crisis in 2008, your portfolio lost 10%. Sounds bad, but actually, exactly that you actually done very well, or you know, and your advisor had done very well. So what we thought was, okay, well, there are a lot of numbers out there, and that we have, and so it's it's difficult to articulate that to the typical investor. So we came up with a proprietary scorecard, a portfolio scorecard, where we rate your portfolio along five dimensions: risk adjusted performance, downside protection. Income, if you care about income from mm-hmm. your portfolio, uh, fees, that's your product fees, your yep. management expense ratio, and then diversification. Uh, not just how many stocks you hold, but also in terms of exposure to different macroeconomic factors, different sector exposures and things like that. So you can look at your portfolio score at sort of this top level, top high level. You know, we give it a score out of 100. We also give it a grade just to reflect the fact that uh me and my co-founder, we're, we're professors. And so, and you, <laughs> so can, you can't do anything without grading it. <laughs> that's right. And also we thought that might be, uh, you know, sort of a 
easier way to catch people's attention Absolutely. and to sort of kind of say, okay, well. A letter grade between A to F is something very powerful for everybody. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So that, you know, we thought everyone would understand. And then you can then drill down further. You go, okay, well, my downside protection, I'm getting like a, a C plus, you know, C or B. Well, mm-hmm. why is that? Then you can click on a downside and then you can look at further at, we have different ratios. We have downside risk, we have downside capture, and then we have explanation to just in a very layman, very simple terms, what do they also mean? And we have uh, educational videos that have been really popular with our user base, animated by a millennial, but actually the, the reach uh, I was... I saw them. They're, yeah. quite, they're quite good. I like yeah, it. Yeah, we've had like the whole age spectrum, that feedback that we that we got, that they really um, appreciated those videos. And then for fees, you can say, oh, you know, I'm getting an F for fees. What does that mean? Because as you know, right now on your... On your uh, statement from your, say, you say you're with a discount broker, you don't see the MERS. You don't, you know, if you hold funds, you don't really see in a very easy fashion how much in management expenses that you pay. And so we sort of bring everything together. Are you um, looking at the actual account fees? If they say they're not on a fee based platform, are you including that in the fee no, calculation as well? No, no. So just we don't, the actual yeah, product Yeah, just the fee product itself. fees. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, CRM2, you kind of have a bit of an idea how much you're paying your, yeah. your advisor yeah. uh, at I the mean, firm this is, level. I mean, this is something with global reach, right? So, I mean, we're talking Canada here. With CRM too, but I mean, mm-hmm. US, I mean, it's about every domicile I see has the same problem. So this applies mm-hmm. across mm-hmm. the board. Right. So CRM two, in our view, didn't go far enough to say, well, you got to no, know, your, you, you know, one aspect is not that easy to find out your product fees unless so you Google back, it. Yeah. So just to give, to give some background to people listening yeah. to places outside of mm-hmm. Canada, CRM two or Client Relationship Management two was a recent compliance related uh, regulation that came out that included many things, including fee disclosure. Unfortunately, the only disclosure that is reported in the statements in terms of fees at this point, is the compensation to the dealership or the advisor Mm -hmm. and not the actual portfolio manager. So unfortunately, Mm -hmm. we have a broken system in Canada where you can see maybe 1% going to the advisor, but you're not seeing another 1% plus taxes and and then fees and whatever else Mm -hmm. in the MER as a line item. So absolutely, you're right. That is is a big gaping hole, at least in our country and and some Mm -hmm. others as well. Right. So that's the sort of portfolio analytics and, you know, uh, each dimension, uh, we also give it a score and a grade uh, as well. And then the other one is sort of right now we've built the accumulation phase in retirement planning uh, and we're working on the drawdown phase because the tax, you know, the tax side of things would be more complicated. Far more complicated. <laughs> right. So we want to be very careful with, mm-hmm. about that. So the typical online calculator that you find assumes that you die at a certain age, 92 at a particular insurance company or 85 that I've seen or 87. Mm-hmm. We don't do that. We use conditional mortality rates from Statistics Canada and your probability of survival doesn't really reach zero until after 110. Yeah. So that's one differentiator. And the second one is about the investments that you're going to use for your retirement savings. Again, a typical calculator would ask you, well, what is your expected rate of return? Yes. Well, first of all, I was like, okay. Great. We'll just see a straight line yeah. for the rest of your life. Yeah, right? I like, don't know that. And yeah. I was never told that. I never calculated it and also assumes no risk. So what we do is that you can build any portfolios using our portfolio builders and you can plug the, that portfolio into the planning. And are you I'm, running in Monte Carlo against these? Yeah, uh, so 10,000 okay. simulations. And then our, all our... Um, Portfolios that you built have data going back to pre-financial crisis, you know, okay. which we consider as sort of, you know, having a good market cycle. Yeah. Now, the uh, benchmarking is always in different parlance is a controversial thing because the question is, what mm-hmm. are you benchmarking to? So mm-hmm. you mentioned a lot of things. Like, so the fee one, for example, like if mm-hmm. you're giving an F on fees, like mm-hmm. what is the benchmark rate you're comparing to? Right. So there in terms of fees, we are taking the view that if you are paying 2.5%, you're getting a poor mark. Mm-hmm. So therefore, it's sort of a, the grade is a continuum. The closer you are to zero, the higher yeah. grade that you're going to get. But again, I think it, mm-hmm. you know, that may be simplifying it much and I'll debate you on this one. It, it, it mm-hmm. comes down to what are you getting in exchange? for that mm. if the person is pushing a 2.5 mm-hmm. percent fund and right. is doing zero planning work mm-hmm. and doing nothing other than saying that's the fund for you 
I agree right. with you entirely. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, uh, if mm-hmm. that person is providing comprehensive financial right. planning, I think maybe right. maybe put a little asterisk say, yeah. this is how much beyond whatever it is, what you know, because zero is not really attainable. Make sure you're getting value for money. Yeah, so that's why fee is only one prong exactly. of the, up to five. So therefore, I think one has to look at the overall, overall score. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'd almost encourage you to basically ask questions around like what services your advisor is providing and try to benchmark that with things. Uh-huh, I think you get uh-huh. a much more true value of what the concept would value that person is providing as an advisor looking at mm-hmm. myself and everybody else is doing the right job. So basically, one thing we didn't mention was, are you looking at alpha versus beta contribution? Are you looking, no? Are- yeah, so so we are, in terms of performance, yeah, we're, you know, sort of risk adjustment, right? So we use, you, you show the shop ratio. We also look at the Sortino, which is based on downside yeah. risk and uh, Roy safety first. So that's the risk adjusted performance. But our platform, if you look at our portfolio builders, for example, for people that are, you know, looking maybe to build their own custom benchmark, or they are looking to start from scratch or mm-hmm. building some sort of a, a core, a more passive core using, say, ETFs. That you see that one of our big builder, that portfolio builder we have is uh, machine learning driven, da- completely data driven. Oh. And there we are trying to manage the risk rather than trying to forecast returns, because I think that risk management in over the long term is a lot easier and a lot more important whereas returns you I know, completely uh, yeah. agree I mean we yeah. don't know what's going to mm-hmm. happen tomorrow but if we can dig our, prevent ourselves from digging a hole it's going to mm-hmm. take a lot longer to get those long term returns mm-hmm. so you mentioned machine learning which mm-hmm. anytime I hear anything AI related mm-hmm. pricks my ears up mm-hmm. what exactly is the application there like what, what what benefit are you getting by throwing uh, machine learning at it yeah so for <laughs> us is that uh, you know a lot of machine learning the supervised version of machine learning a lot of applications about you know prediction whereas i think in finance we've always had a lot of data we've always done a lot of statistical analysis so it's not new it's not like you know in social media marketing where we've only in the last 10 years have yeah. been able to gather consumer information but what we try to do is using the supervised um, model to say well look there are these different asset classes out there we use about 25 different asset classes right now for Canada and you can build different portfolios and what a lot of people do, you know, for example, if I don't want exposure, you know, so it goes back to another inspiration story for the company. It's about, you know, someone, work, a petroleum engineer working in Alberta, human capital tied up in energy. And so to diversify from that perspective, you may not want his or her portfolio. Interesting. Financial so you are actually factoring be, in human capital into the entire equation. Right. So the thing is that, what well, do we just say, okay, you don't use any energy stocks? Well, again, to the extent that you diversify, some of, you know, just because you have a couple of stocks in energy doesn't mean that you have a high exposure to energy because you've got to look at the diversification effects. So what we use machine learning is, is to say, look, we've got 25 asset classes and you can do millions and millions of combinations of those 25 asset classes. And we use machine learning to say, look, if I don't want overall portfolio exposure to energy, or I work in the financial sector, I don't want overall portfolio exposure to financials, or if you know interest rates are expected to rise, I read about it, and so oh. I, I want to have lower interest rate exposures, we use the machine to, to crank out those portfolios, and then we can start screening. So this is doing things more efficiently rather than to say, okay, well, I have no idea how to put together a portfolio that can help me minimize certain risk that I want. And so that's where we leverage data and machine learning to say, okay, well, give me portfolios that are according to my preferences. So if you look at our portfolio builders, we start up with 24 million portfolios, and then we can, um, depending on the answers to certain risk questions that we can find you. It's interesting. I, I very much like the aspect of you factoring human capital into the equation. That's mm-hmm. something that's not done much in this industry and even on my practice, I think, to a degree, simply because mm-hmm. it becomes highly bespoke at that point. Mm-hmm. And the other mm-hmm. issue becomes the transparency of the issue, right? Because the client doesn't see their human capital on the statement, right. right? It's like, oh, wow, the oil sector is doing really well. I work in the oil sector, yet mm-hmm. I own no oil. Like, they forget that on the upside, right? Mm-hmm. I, mean, I think that's interesting. I mean, the fact that you can show them that mm-hmm. uh, is mm-hmm. powerful because it's, there's the reminder of what it is you're doing. No, you already right. have this much exposure and it's yeah. the biggest exposure you have. So right. we should diversify away from that. Mm-hmm. Is there any 
any accommodation for other financial assets or liabilities? Like, are you looking at, you know, their exposure to real estate outside the portfolio or how much, you know, maybe they have private debt outstanding? Is that being factored in at all at this point? Yeah, no. So we, what we're working with just publicly traded securities and in the, this version, in the free version, the mm-hmm. portfolio builder is just using ETF. So 25 different asset classes and sub classes yeah. uh, and each represented by an index and that index could be tracked by different ETFs. So it is at that sort of just asset side of things right now. And so ultimately it goes back to something that you were saying earlier is what is the goal here to replace an advisor or to provide transparency and information and data so that an investor could be working with and be better informed as well as the advisor, you know, having the data to show the client. I think at the end of the day, when we, when you get to more complicated issues, if the advisor were to have the information in front to show the client, it just sort of makes everything a little bit more transparent, a little bit easier, and also to help the advisor find the type of portfolios that he or she may be looking for for a particular client. True. I mean, very little exists in this mm-hmm. marketplace for being able to do what you're talking about. I mean, I will often come across clients or prospects who come in with a statement that has, you know, 35 different holdings, right? Mm-hmm. All of them, mm-hmm. either ETFs or mutual funds. And it's to me, at the time, I can't figure out what they were trying to accomplish on the portfolio management side. Uh, it looks maybe like a collection of good ideas at the time. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes, I think that the reason that's done is it's a way of almost... The advisor who has no mechanism for actually implementing something properly almost scrambles to try to mm. do what they think is best. And what they think is best is let me add a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that at a time with no real quantifiable way of, of back testing that or making sure it works. Right. And all we end up with this jumbled mess with no strategy. So uh, the ability to have a tool like that is something that I think would be very powerful to the entire advisor community. Where are you drawing your data from at this point? Is it all drawn from Morningstar or publicly available sources or where is it uh, Yeah, we, we have two subscription to uh, exchange traded securities and also the fund data comes from Morningstar. Yep, that makes so a lot of sense. Combine, yeah, we <laughs> combine those two sources. So one of the things you mentioned earlier was helping clients develop their own custom benchmark. What's the mm-hmm, level of mm-hmm. thinking? Like what's coming in with that? Is that driven by the financial plan or is that driven by their risk assessment? Well, see, because right now we use, we look at, you, you, if you've linked your account with us and we looked at your portfolio and say, okay, well, you are closest to a 60-40 or you're closest to an 80-20 or you're closest to a 20-80. Now, what do we put in that? 80 and that 20. So right now we have the, the stock market is just a TSX cap composite. And the fixed income part is the um, aggregate bonds, mm-hmm. Canadian. But someone may say, well, look, actually that benchmark is easy to beat if I've invested in the US in the last few years or I've Absolutely. invested globally. So again, depending on what your investment policy is, you know, if you're looking at global investing, like, for example, the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, they use global equities as their market. And then it, it just, yeah, it just, I think that should be determined by the advisor, or by the investor. And so right now, we're, yeah, okay, we just have, in a very simplistic way. If you're letting the advisor and the investor <laughs> determine that, there's going to be a lot of home country bias, unfortunately. That's just the yeah. reality of the situation. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah. the flexibility of that part of it. Not to dictate yeah. what the benchmark yeah. should be, but to say right. here, you can yeah. build it based on whatever factors. Yeah. What are you using for risk tolerance assessment at this point? Was that developed in-house or a third party? Or Yeah, no, we have a, a fairly standard risk tolerance survey. Again, we are mindful that we are not registered advisors. And also for a lot of advisors, particularly, they have to use their own in-house Know your client questionnaire. So we have a one that is fairly standard, but we found a lot of users are jumping right into. Yeah, I know I'm eighty twenty. I know I'm a you know hundred percent. Oh, so, I would love how, to know. Yeah, this. exactly. So yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, here's the yeah. downside. Are you eighty uh-huh. twenty still? Ooh, maybe not. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. no. So people, it's behaviorally, it's been a very yeah. interesting journey so far. It's interesting because on my this, side, yeah. I often, one of the tests we do with financial planning is essentially to show them, first of all, that we stress test it in a number of ways. Monte Carlo mm-hmm. being one, minimum rate of return analysis is another one. And we'll show clients that, hey, you know, your plan works at a rate of return of zero. So the question right. comes down yeah. to why is it you feel the need to hold 80% stock, right? right. Like you mm-hmm. could end up with anywhere between 80 to 0% stock is an acceptable Mm -hmm. framework for you. And oftentimes what we find is that it's this fear of missing out, their fear of missing Mm -hmm. on that. But when you tell them that they don't need to have that, Mm -hmm. it's a different conversation. Right. right? They're just like, oh, why am I doing this to myself? 
right? Like, yeah. So it's a difference to that. I've seen right. the opposite side of that. Have you con- contemplated or considered or are you working on any kind of integrations into financial planning software? Because I have to think that being able to tie into what's being done there would only help potentially create a better outcome in terms of portfolio construction. Uh, tying, so having feedback from the yeah, some, planning side? Exactly. Yeah, no, no. Actually, that sounds like a, it sounds very interesting given what you need and then working backwards to say that Great, this is how you should invest. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so given this, I mean, you must be at this point getting to see, I mean, we all, we all joke about getting to see like the biggest mistakes people make when they, when they invest for themselves. You actually have data yeah. <laughs> to actually say this is the most common thing. Like, have you, what are the biggest errors you're seeing people make in general? Well, I mean, we haven't thought too much. I, I you know, this is something, yet. yeah, we're not, um, we still have to think about, you know, we'll, one thing for sure, our privacy statements is very clear we yeah. will never sell anyone's data we're not looking to monetize that using people's data that said given our research background we could be providing some research to say hey you know in your age group this is what other people are doing and also benchmark to just out of interest this is what people also around the age of 30 to 35 that's what people are doing and looking at some sort of common trends and things like that, just from a purely research perspective. But we haven't done that yet mm. because, you know, we've been in beta for almost two months and, you know, there are a lot a, of data, but... You're going to yeah. have a treasure trove of, of like behavioral finance data to yeah. go with that. I mean, yeah. some of the studies I've seen, like companies like Vanguard and the behavioral mistakes that people make, quite just, just fascinating, right? Because you, yeah. you think about how much we put out there about how we have to, you're supposed to conduct, conduct yourself and we find that advisors, clients, just not working the way they're supposed to, unfortunately. So I'd be very curious to see what's not working in those going forward. Yes. Definitely put down the road. Definitely yeah. down the road. Well, mm-hmm. yes, there's going to be a number of academics interested in your document. <laughs> <laughs> it just so happens you're probably going to know a lot of them. So in terms of constructing this business, tell me about the, the journey, a little bit more about the journey about that. So uh, how big is the team right now? We are a team of 10, including my two business partners. So we started just, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I had the idea, you know, building the factor models, but on a platform, you know, Mm -hmm. rather than on a spreadsheet. And I just had students, master finance students with an engineering background, with a programming background, just help me, you know, build, and we built a, a proof of concept. And then we had people testing that, you know, the portfolio builders, the the dashboard for the analytics and so on. And that attracted um, an angel investor okay. um, who was looking to offer in the retail wealth management space, you know, a sort of product like wealth scope. So he, that angel investor has become my business partner. And so we've been in the last 12 months, it's been a year, we brought in, we built an IT team and working with designers because we also wanted, we knew from the get go, we wanted to tackle the UI as well. So in the U.S., there are a couple of companies that are providing, you know, analytics, but they're only providing the API. Yes. But we wanted to tackle the front end because, you know, again, as educators, we wanted to have a shot at explaining some of these concepts to people. I figured B2C at the Mm -hmm. same time, you're going to have to Mm -hmm. focus heavily Mm -hmm. on the UI. Right, right. Yeah, so we've been fortunate. We've been, I've been adamant from day one to bring in software engineers that have an appreciation of finance, You're dealing with a lot of data. Where do you find these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sorry, so yeah. we've been very lucky. Like on the on the back end, we have someone who'd worked at um, Thomson Reuters for 10 mm. years. Another one, you know, is a PhD CFA mm. that had been building all the analytics APIs. And on the front end, um, a lead front end person, he actually has CFA level one. So Good. it just makes things a lot easier. Good, interesting. Yeah. It's funny because a lot of the companies we, we interview, they, they basically have a lot of people who just don't work in finance because they want to kind of stop thinking in the way we get our heads all caught up. Mm-hmm. It's a different market, but you know, right. given what you're doing, it's very much got to be the opposite. Yeah. One of yeah. the a couple of things I want to come back to that you just mentioned, one of them, you know, and I didn't mention this earlier, you're one of the few people, you're the only person I've seen talking about bringing factor-based analytics to mm-hmm. the consumer model. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is something that's much more heavily spoken about on the institutional side. Right. Yeah. Talk about that, like why it's important and why you feel mm-hmm. it's, it's necessary. Right. To understand... The risks, not just the risk, you know, a standard deviation, yeah. you know, of your portfolio. I, I, I feel it's very important for investors to understand what's driving the risk. So I wrote an article, is on our on our website. Say, look, you know, two portfolios can have very similar drawdown, can have very similar 
downside capture and, and standard deviation, but what's driving the risk can be very different. For sector risk, for example, your exposure to energy versus financial versus IT, you know, again, the human capital side of things. In order to find the right portfolios, taking into account human capital, you have that sort of view of that risk decomposition. When using a factor model, applying it to macroeconomic factors or sectors or style, value versus growth, uh, momentum, and so on, that's what we've been doing in uh, financial research for the last 20 years. And it's yeah. widely available. Just hasn't been brought the, down Yeah, it's been brought level. down to the consumer Yeah, exactly, well, to I mean, the consumer even level. So I find that the implementation mm-hmm. of that sort of analytics and portfolio management, mm-hmm. I've only been seeing it recently like implemented. I think everybody's had kind of a hard time to try to reconcile or integrate that into the current, the previous models, but I'm mm-hmm. starting to see that now. So back to the story of you guys' challenges. So funding, it seems like you guys got funding pretty early. Yeah, I mean, you know, given that we have been working for a while and have some savings, so we have uh, a few investors and okay. early stage was obviously self-funded mm-hmm. at the but beginning. But no venture so. cap at this point, just all kind of no, angel No, no, because I, I think that um, I don't know if this is the right time for VCs at the moment. Yeah. We like to we like to sort of find our ways and have that conviction to build a bigger team and product. Sounds good. What kind of challenges have you been facing in Mm -hmm. the construction of this? Talent. You know, (laughs) given given that I, it's easy to find someone who, you know, um, software engineer, they can always write something, but you never know what they've actually written if they don't have an appreciation of statistics mm-hmm. and and basic finance, yeah. right? So so that's been a challenge. You know, oh as, as a startup, um, there are a lot of people competing for talent. All the banks are hiring. Yeah. There are a lot of bigger startups than we are in fintech and other fields, right, yeah. of, of technology. So I think t- recruiting talent has been the toughest part. And, and a lot of engineers and I don't think my team would disagree with me. A lot of them like to work on their own, just be coding. But whereas for me, I need a very collaborative process, yeah. right? And I think it's a particular challenge for you because, mm-hmm. I mean, you hear and software engineers talk all the time about how someone who's really adept at what they do can basically achieve the same thing with one third the code that someone who's not, right? Mm-hmm. And then you throw in mm-hmm. the challenge of truly understanding the financial concepts you're talking yeah. about and having someone who's going to actually look at the code and tell some per- this person knows what they're talking about on both sides of the coin. That's got to be really challenging. What's the response been from people you've, you've utilized the platform thus far been? Yeah, we had, as you know, there was an article that was written about us um, a couple of weeks ago and mm-hmm. we definitely reached a capacity issue because we had no <laughs> idea that so many people could sign up within one day. So it's been just overwhelming. Most of the response had been to say, I've never seen a product like this before for retail investors. And uh, they haven't been on fire my advisor because that. <laughs> <laughs> no, some, some said I'd like to bring this to my advisor and yeah. have a conversation with my advisor. Yeah. So it's been just in terms of the analytics with our content, the videos, and, and all that. The people have been really appreciative. But at the same time, there's been some frustration for people mm-hmm. that are so on our site, as you have seen. Rather than inputting your portfolio and having to keep track of your transactions Mm -hmm. and stock splits and distributions, uh, you can use an aggregation service Uh to link your accounts, right? And have the the data, your holdings, and directly transferred onto our platform for our analysis. Unfortunately, we don't have any control of that. And also, we happen to have released our beta during a very volatile time, times of the market. So that's the, you know, the pros and cons are that the pros is more people are thinking about, okay, well, I should maybe find out more about my portfolio so that I can sleep better at night. So I need the independent second opinion. But at the same time, a lot of financial institutions are shutting down traffic from aggregation services. They so are. It's interesting. Yeah. There's been, it's been an interesting pull, tug of, of war over that. And I've been, had this conversation a couple of times, but the good news is it looks like at least some of the Canadian banks are now starting to release APIs for that sort of thing. Because I know what you mean, like the good and bad of you just utilizing Yodely on the back end is that it works until it doesn't. And you got to go back in and put in your password. And just, right. just last week, my, uh, my bank for my, um, that I use for my office, they changed their front end, their, their front page. Well, guess what happened? The connection was down for five days, right? Like it was, yeah, it's, it's, it's a frustrating, frustrating right. thing until, you know, this country gets out of the stone age when it comes to this stuff and moves into a more open architecture system, but it, it's That's happening right. slowly. It's happening. 
thankfully. So uh, one of the last questions I typically ask people is what excites you about what's going, what's moving forward with your company? Like what's in the product pipeline or development that you have or the plans that you have that really is, is really that you're passionate about? Well, first of all, I really think that there's a lot of value in what we provide. And I don't think there's any anyone else in this country doing what we're doing to the extent that, we, that, that, that we're frankly. doing. Yeah. And I think there are a lot of people out there that might say, oh, we're going to help you build your portfolio like a pro or, or pick stocks like a pro. But I don't really they understand buy the what that means. software package for $10,000 a year. Yeah, I know what that right. is. Right. And, so, yeah. and, you know, and you look at the team and I go, well, who is helping you? help your users yes. invest like what, a pro. What books have you read? Because there's not a single <laughs> academic on your... You know, like. So that really um, is exciting. And also, you know, technology is exciting. As someone who had been involved in financial research for the last 25 years, doing a lot of statistical programming in the last 25 years, and now finding out that I actually don't know anything about web development, you know, because <laughs> I, don't, I don't use Python, I don't use JavaScript. Yeah. And, so, um, and so learning from my team, that's extremely interesting for me. You know, every day I go into the office and finding about what they're doing, these new ways of solving a problem and, and providing that information on our platform to convey the information to our users is, um, yeah, it's extremely Fantastic. exciting for me. Fantastic. Well, I look forward to using your platform going forward. Mm -hmm. But thank you very much for taking the time to come in. This has been great. Thanks for having me. And that was my interview with Pauline. Hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you liked what you heard in terms of Wellscope. I know myself, I will be definitely using that to assess just how good a job I'm doing for my clients. So with that, thank you yet again for joining me. If you enjoyed this podcast, please uh, feel free to leave a comment on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or whatever it is you get your podcasts. Thank you. Until next time. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, or find more episodes at fintechimpact.co.